Well, thank you for, uh, for being here for this last um, session. Uh, and um, so I, I will be speaking about the large scale structure and, and the ideas of, uh, that we've explored about response functions will be taken from um, uh, some notes I wrote from, from summer school at Lesouche a few years ago. And also a lot will be taken from uh, two papers that uh, I did with uh, Asufi Tarouya who is here and, and, um, and uh, Takairo Nishimichi. Uh, so, uh, so let me start with very general uh, uh, things which is basically uh, uh, the growth of structures. This is a system. Let me think of it as a, as a, as a as a system I, I, I want to, to study, not so much to, to understand how it works, but, but to, to be able to use it as a laboratory for testing uh, theories of gravity. We all know that the Euclid, LSST and all these projects have been uh, designed in part to uh, put constraint on, on modified gravity theories, so that means that at some point we should be able to have a good enough understanding of these systems to be able to actually use these observations as laboratories. So that uh, ask, I mean, then we have to ask ourselves the question, how much do we understand this system? Where do we understand them uh, accurately enough so that they can indeed be used as laboratories? So one of the ideas or uh, things you can think of and the reason why it's a difficult question in the case of large scale structure is because it's nonlinear evolution. So but even though we know perfectly well, at least for standard gravity, the, the, the equation of motions of this system is basically the Vlasov Poisson system. Uh, yet, because of the nonlinear evolution, it's a complicated task and it's a complicated task at different levels, uh, not only the dynamical evolution but also even the definition of observables might be a uh, not trivial thing to do uh, once you, you enter the nonlinear regime. And we've seen uh, during this uh, few days a few, uh, few propositions to go beyond just power spectra, for instance. So basically, if you think of this system as a, as a as kind of black box, uh, things that, that takes modes uh, in the initial conditions and make them evolve. Uh, if you're in linear theory, it's just a, it's just a linear evolution. And we have a pointer here. So it's just a linear evolution. There is transfer function uh, hidden he here, uh, depending on the way or on the complexity of your nonlinear evolution. Uh, linear evolution, you may have uh, complex uh, structure in terms of, of mod couplings. Although, uh, if uh, if if this is the same, if this is 3D Fourier mode and these are 3D Fourier modes as well, then you expect a delta function here. And then, but when you have uh, higher order mode coupling, then you expect something more complicated. So, kind of theory work program for uh, work program for series is is to identify relevant observables. By default, it will be power spectra, but it's not necessarily the case. And to build control predictions of these observables. Control predictions mean not only the, uh, the expected value of this of this power spectra, but actually the world distribution function of these observables. And that's a more complicated task. Also, I will not really touch it here. Um, so that means the covariances in terms of observables. Uh, and, and, and the oral structure, which is even more difficult, right? How much do we trust our, our, our predictions? So, but in the, in, the, in the following, I won't go into too many details of that, so I will ignore the rich space, short noise, and so on. So, as I was saying, it's a simple system. That is, we know the, the motion equation. This is just a Vlasov Poisson system. And this is basically what numerical simulations are, are, are simulating. Um, it could be n body, it could be more uh, now sophisticated scheme of describing this, uh, this uh, set of uh, these particles, this, uh, this system. Uh, but so it's a, it's a well-defined problem somehow, and, and being here in, uh, uh, in this institute, which is mathematically oriented problem, we can say, okay, it's a well-defined problem. We have a set of particles uh, in an expanding universe, uh, and, and they are uh, self-gravitating, so only gravity is at play. How much do we understand uh, this system? And it's, uh, it's actually a difficult uh, question that we all know. 
that and the simplified problem is to go to single flow and this is motivated by the fact that initially uh, assuming that the, the particles of the universe are dark matter particles that is so not considering or assuming that uh, that neutrinos play only a, a negligible role so as bions or, or cold dark matter particles are cold enough so that their velocity dispersion uh, is, is small compared to the velocity gradient, so the velocity uh, induced by, by, the, by gravity. If you assume that, then you have a close uh, system here involving only its density in the velocity field. And if you further assume that you can expand uh, that with respect to the initial conditions, then you are in a good shape to do uh, perturbation theory calculation. Right? And I, I'll just uh, give uh, some insights about what, what uh, a way to, to rephrase perturbation theory calculation is to say we have here the linear evolution, so this is a green function of your system. In, in the case of this fluid, there's not even a, we end up with a function which is only time dependent, so eta is you can reduce time if you want. And there's no dependence in scale, so there's no k dependence. And when you go to higher orders, you have a much more complicated kernel, which is k dependent, and so on. So all, you all know that if you are familiar with perturbation theory. Um, and there are some general grammatic representation of that, which I, I will uh, and, uh, just review. I mean, very uh, rapidly here, uh, where you have a representation of the power spectrum with the with the, here the lines or the of the green function, so this is this G function, and, and you have one loop expression of the power spectrum. So this is just standard perturbation theory, and there are many now many flavors, uh, many ways to change, to uh, introduce alternative ways of doing perturbation theory. So let, let me start with presentation by some, uh, one of the first uh, occurrence of this, of this idea of, of response function. So the response function is to say how much the system is reacting to a change in the initial conditions. Right? This is a very general thing, right? Uh, I have a complex system which evolved nonlinearly, so I change something and in, in the initial conditions, basically here is a field, and I see how it reacts, how, how this change propagates to the, to the final uh, Condition. So this is, I can do it that as, at the level of one realization and that will lead to the notion of propagators or things that have been dis, uh, described as propagators. And I can, uh, and we see later, I can uh, define that as a more, as more general system. So I think this system as a, uh, as a system that transforms a linear power spectrum into a, a non-linear, I mean, into a, a fluid with, with set of statistical properties. So uh, basically, the, the propagators are, are expressing the way, uh, if I measure mod here in, my fi in the final conditions, how this mod is related to the initial field. What is, is dependent? It's, 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 uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's dependent. So it's actually a very general uh, construction. So imagine that you have a field G, which could be the density field, the velocity field, or any I mean, galaxy field, if you want. And you assume that you can express it perturbatively in terms of the initial conditions with the initial modes with a kernel here that has, does not, doesn't have to be local. So it's kind of generalization of basically what, uh, uh, what Roman was, was uh, just uh, presenting uh, this morning. Uh, um, so we have this, this, this function here. This is not really the, the, the response function I'm talking about. The response function are defined as the, the, the how the, the Final mode is, 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 is affected when you, um, when you change the initial, when a set, when you change the set of initial uh, modes. So this is the functional derivative of my final mode, of given mode, uh, with respect to a change of initial modes. With this, that is, when you ensemble averaged. So that it's a function of not only it's a function of, of the system itself. The system itself, because of mod couplings, tells you that it, this evolution, the way my final mode is going to depend on the initial modes, is something which depends on the whole, on the whole set of modes. It, it, does, it depends on all of them. So you have to basically ensemble average, and that defines this function gamma, that is a, the uh, multipoint propagator. So this is generalization of, of things that 
we introduced uh, some time ago with, so with, with uh, Roman and Martin. In 2005, well, actually, uh, Roman Scotia, Roman Crochet introduced it before, introduced this, uh, this two point, the, the two point, the propagators, the two point um, uh, gamma function. Uh, and, and, it, and they showed that it, it it adds a lot, it has a lot of nice properties, in particular that it was possible to resum partly at least um, uh, the, 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 the contribution of the loops that comes in, right? So this is this idea that you can define this propagator, so it's a generalization of the green function, so it's a kind of dressed green function, right? So you can see that as a green function uh, in presence when you have uh, a set of, of modes in your system. Uh, if you had no other modes, it would be just uh, the linear theory, the green function. But it, because of this mod coupling effect, uh, you have uh, you have this, right? You have a more complicated object. And this, as as can be generalized, as I just said before, uh, as multipoint propagators. So you can, in, in a in a diagrammatic representation, you can see that as an expansion with respect to the initial condition. So this blob here would be just. Uh, the tree order plus one loop and so on. So it contains uh, in itself a lot of diagrams. In, in the context of, of uh, gravitational instabilities, this is the one for the two-point propagator and this is the one for the multipoint. Uh, you know that in, in this context you have only uh, quadratic coupling, so you have only this type of vertices. But if you have a more complex system, in particular if you have modified gravity systems, then you would expect more complicated diagrams. But still the notion exists, right? And then this is an uh, important result uh, that we were very proud of and we show that uh, uh, you can actually reorganize your whole perturbation series in, in such a way that, for instance, the power spectrum is a sum of this diagram glued together. Uh, and that's, uh, that's very general. We showed it in the context of gravitational instabilities, but this, this is very general so that indeed you can uh, really reorganize your whole, your whole perturbation theories. And this is true for power spectrum, so it's a sum of square and, and for bispectrum it will be a, a sum of diagram which are here uh, slightly, uh, slightly more complicated. Uh, so this is the basis of some uh, schemes that have been developed in the, in the community for doing perturbation theory. I'm thinking of a, a reg PT that, that um, we developed with uh, uh, Nishimishi and, and, and Taruya, and, the, and for which we have there is a public code. And this is really uh, uh, the, the basis for this expansion. So the idea is to focus not on, on the power spectrum, but on these objects. So these objects are kind of, you can see them a kind of response function or generalized response function in, in, at the, for, for a specific realization. And the idea is, is, is now, how much do we understand these objects? If I if we understand if you have a perfect understanding on these buildi building blocks, then we are done. Right? We can we can build every, any observable we want in principle, at least in this I mean power spectra and base by spectra and so on. So this is um, this is uh, the the starting point of this of this uh, this work, and uh, this is the result. Of this of uh, one of the la la latest results. So this is a measurement of G1 plus. So if I go back to my notation. Uh, I didn't really ex explain that, that the, the, the first uh, indi was the index here, the indices in general uh, um, for a single fluid, this is either the density or the velocity, so there are two values if you want, one and two, one for the density, two for the, for the velocity, so this is uh, the, the response function for, for the for propagator for the density here. And, and the, and the second in index is for the initial conditions. So this plus means that we are in the growing mode in the initial conditions. Right? So it's because this is how numerical simulations are, are, are set, you could imagine that you ask yourself what is a response, what is a propagator or, um, for uh, not only uh, the growing mode but also the decaying mode. So actually there is a, it's a matrix here that should be measured. Uh, but anyway, this is, which is what, we, uh, what is restricted to here. And this is the way it behaves. This is the numerical simulations, the result of the, of the simulations are the, the crosses or the symbols. So can we see what it is? And this is uh, the theoretical prediction. Um, 
So the theoretical prediction are based on perturbation theory, but not, non, not only, it's based also on this resummation of the infrared modes that, that is possible to do. This is, uh, has been pioneered by, by, by Scotty Maro and Croce, and in, with Filippo, and we also uh, reconsidered this problem in the, in, the, the, uh, in the context of what we call econal approximation. I, I may say a word about that a bit later. So the, the, the basically the, the, what you expect to have is that G1 plus of K behaves like basically exponential minus K square sigma D square uh, over 2 if sigma D is the, the uh, RMS of the displacement field and this is due to the infrared mode only, I mean, only that and, and then if you, you can correct for uh, one loop or two loop explicit uh, corrections to that uh, and you get different, I mean, dip, you depart from this, uh, from this behavior and this is, the, so, so the bottom panel is basically that. If you take G and you multiply by this, then you should get one for basically three order results, you know, that resummed three order results. And, and the green line here are for one loop and this line are for two loops. So this is basically the, the precision with which we can, we can uh, describe this, um, uh, this uh, propagator. I should say that this is not perfect by far and this is the main reason standard, uh, well in general perturbation theory is, 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 is limited in terms of accuracy. Ma basically this is because we, we have not such a good description of this uh, propagator and this if you, if you uh, go into the details, this is because this is the, the contribution which are most sensitive to the, to the UV path, the UV uh, modes. Anyway, uh, so you, you can still have a good description of this, of these uh, propagators and you can go higher orders, so this is uh, the one involving two uh, initial modes and this is how we uh, are able to actually uh, uh, describe uh, results of measurement and simulation. So the red points here are, are propagators measured in simulation. So out of that you can, you can think of building um, power spectra. So this is the first level of, of response function. I mean how the system is responding to individual modes. But as I was saying I may want to have another level of response function. That is how now I can see the system as something which transform a power spectrum into a nonlinear power spectrum. And I can ask myself how this, how this system is reacting to a change of my initial conditions. All right, so what I was showing is, is, is basically the relation between linear and nonlinear. And now I want to go to do it uh, in, in more complicated thing. If I think of, of, of um, equation of motion for that, uh, but it's actually been written, uh, been written down by Pietroni uh, 10 years ago uh, and, and surprisingly only 10 years ago because this equation are, are nothing but basically the, the, the Plasov Poisson system which is known for decades and, and it's just a rewriting of, of, of this system. Here this is the first equation of a, actually a series of, of a polyarchy of equation which relates the way the power spectra are, are, are evolving with time uh, as a function of the bispectrum and so on. So you have a similar equation for the bispectrum in terms of the tri-spectrum and so on. So this is the way that now this, if I solve this system, I'm basically able to solve how uh, my system is transforming a power spectrum into a, a nonlinear power spectrum or any other observables actually. So that, that goes a step closer to what I want actually. I don't want just how the system is evolving for a given set of modes, but I want to have the, the, the way my observables are, are reacting. So this is uh, getting close to what um, we introduced a few years ago, which is a response function for the, for the power spectrum. So, it, so you imagine your system as kind of black box. It takes the cosmo, as the entry, in the entry the cosmological parameters and the linear power spectrum, which depends somehow on the cosmological parameters, and you build observables. So the question now, and, and then in principle, the question is if you change now a bit and, and we're focused on the linear power spectrum somewhere in the, so for a given value of Q for, Q for instance like this one, how the system is changed at the end. 
That is, what's the variation of the nonlinear power spectrum uh, as a function of k if you change a given q, and that that will be encoded by uh, my response function here. So this kernel function is is defined as d p nonlinear of k over d p linear of q. Right? It doesn't have to be k equal q anymore because it's not linear theory. So and, and this is basically the reason that we are introducing this function is that it encodes away the mode coupling effect. It encodes away a change in, in, the, in, the, in the value of mode in, in Q is going to propagate into the power spectrum for, for, for K. So, um, uh, there are good reasons we want to do that. And, and it is uh, expressed here is that if you know this kernel function, then you know how to move from one model to another if it's close enough. So basically, we have now numerical simulations at our disposal for, for specific models. For, for Euclid, we have this flagship simulation. So with this given set of, for well-defined set of cosmological parameters, we have exquisite precision on the power spectrum, on the matter power spectrum, at least on the power spectrum in general. Uh, for these cosmological models. At the end, anyway, uh, all, all of these uh, analytical approaches are going to be um, checked against, to be verified against uh, these numerical results. I mean, the validity range of our calculations in, in all cases is, is um, validated with numerical simulation. So uh, let's do it the other way around. That is, OK, I, I, at least I have a. A model for which I know the exact answer, as exact as it can be. So this is my starting point. But this is not the model I want to, to actually uh, uh, consider. I want to consider a slightly different model, M2. So if I, but if I know the response function of that model, M1, I can move from M1, M1 sorry, to M2 if they are not too far away, in some sense. So I can, I can yeah. And using, uh, so it's now called this R, oh, exactly the response function is here, right? So that if we have now a good description of that, the idea is, is, is not only to, is, is, is now to build actually, uh, to be able to predict different power, sp power spectrum for different models. So this is uh, the idea we pursued, and this is the first measurement of this response function. Um, and you see that it, it kind of broad things. So this is as a function of time. Here, this is early time. Early time, you see this for Q. So it's for a given K. Mm, it's not given here. For this K, I think. Uh, and uh, as a function of Q. So you see that there is a the signature of, of a linear evolution, which is this, this bump here, which corresponds to the uh, 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 which corresponds to the linear case. If you have only the linear evolution, there would be a, only a non-zero value for this for when k equals q. But because of nonlinear evolution, you have a broad function. So we, we explored a bit more the mathematical properties of this, and, and this is what we found. It's not this form is actually not published uh, yet. Uh, this, so this is uh, this kernel function, this uh, formal derivative here. So it contains two parts. One is a delta function in k minus q. And here you recover the, uh, the two-point propagators I was mentioning before for each mode, for, each, for k, for each in index here, a or b. Right? It could be the density, density, the density velocity, or the velo velocity, velocity for, for what we are interested in. So there is a delta function part and a smooth part, which actually can be re-expressed as a, as a tri-spectrum, so as a four-point correlation function in the modes that mix final, final modes, uh, so the late modes that, that, that are contributing to this power spectrum, and the initial modes for, with respect to which I'm, I'm taking the derivative. So this is this function average over the angles between uh, k, and, k and q. Yes. Uh, a priori, it's on expectation, I think. So, 
Uh, we were very excited about this because it, 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 it indicated that uh, this response function could be measured in a single realization. Actually, when you, when we really tried to think about it, it didn't work. That is, uh, you get, uh, well, Taruya, my command, we get always zero here. Um, for s um, it's the same problem as measuring uh, covariances. Exactly the same problem. So you cannot avoid having multiple realization. This is our conclusion, but we have to. Uh. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is, you see the two contribution, and this is a more uh, accurate determination of this response function. So you see here, so the bin, or, or the size of the bin is smaller, so you have a, a better resolution in, in, in wave modes. And you see here the, the delta contribution, the direct delta contribution here, and which peaks here, and the smooth part, right? And the question is now, do we understand this, this, these curves? And, and the, the first try is obviously to go, from, to go for perturbation theory and see what perturbation theory has to say about this, about this uh, response function. And this is the shape you expect, sorry, one step back. Uh, this, the part, the delta, the, the direct part here, we know it's, it's, a res, it's a propagators I was mentioning before. So we have already explored that in details over the, over the years. So I'm not going back to this, to this part. I'm going to focus on that part uh, and, and re express in terms of perturbation theory that quantity, right? So if you do uh, one loop, then you have two contributions there that contribute to one, one, this diagram is, is, is bringing this part and, and this diagram is bringing this part. Uh, very different actually. And what you see is basically the superposition of these two uh, with different sign actually, there's change of sign. Uh, it's positive and negative in one side. So, so basically it tells you that uh, our modes are propagating from, from large scale to small scale or small scale to large scale. And the, the dominant effect is more is in this time, that is the propagation of large scale to small scale, not the other way around. And so depending on, 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 on K, you have different, okay, different things. And it's, it's analytical, right? Because we know exactly the one loop results. Uh, now, if you go to two loop, you have more diagrams, but you can do, do it as well. So this is basically a, uh, this is a, the two loop contribution of the power spectrum where, where I split, where I, I take one of, the, one of the power spectrum out because I, deriv I make a derivation with respect to that. So, so this is the first two diagrams correspond to my delta function. These are contributing to the propagators. Uh, and the second uh, set, I mean the last two lines, are with this corresponding to the, to the smooth part of this response function and these are given here. So you can actually compute that. We knew how to compute two loop corrections for the power spectrum. So it can be done and you can compare then to, um, uh, let me show that on this one. Um, I'm not sure, I'm uh, comparing this. To, uh, to results of simulations. And so this is standard perturbation theory and, and, and I don't know if you see, well, you can see that here. As you, so as you go uh, in time, so redshift 3 to 0.35 for different k, so this is quite large k and, and much smaller k, 0.3 you see here. Um, and you see that um, the, the standard has kind of uh, weird behavior that is not really fitting well when you go to low z, but at high redshift we have perfect agreement of the whole uh, shape of this uh, response function, in particular this part. And, and, and the location where the, the, when you have this change of sign. Mm -hmm. um, so it gives, a, a, to start with, a, a perturbation theory is, is, is the right, I mean, it's giving you a, a very good um, flavor of how it works, of how this response function, or the structure of this response function. Um, now when you go in the details, you can see that, as I said, there, were, there are some departures. And we, we understood in this, um, in this study, at least partly where it, it, it comes from, at least these, these errors here. And it's kind of subtle thing, and it goes back to this problem of econal approximation. 
and, and let me uh, focus on these diagrams. So, if I consider this diagram when Q is close to K, uh, it's possible to get from Q to K with a infrared mode, with a long wavelength. And, and in that case, the vertex is unbounded because the vertex goes like 1 over K minus Q. And if K minus Q is large, then go, it blows up. And so you cannot do perturbation theory, you have to resum things. Uh, and it goes back to this econal idea that we had with, with Filippo that in this regime, so econal means that the, the wavelength along the line, along the propagator, is hard, that is, 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 is shorter, I mean, so it's a it large, larger k than the, uh, the mode it is interacting with. It's like uh, when you have a, a light propagating in a medium where the wavelength of the light is much shorter than the scale in which the medium is changing. This is the basis of the economic approximation. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, and so, in this case, you can actually partly resum this, this vertex contribution, so we have these, these loops, and this motivates uh, uh, corrections to, uh, to this uh, uh, calculation, this two-loop calculation. So, it's actually not standard PT, the, the model we are using for describing uh, this uh, response function is, uh, is basically standard PT with this econal resummation. Uh, at least um, uh, uh, some uh, effective way of resumming uh, these diagrams. So, I, I, I won't detail the exact form we are using, but in the paper we are, we are, we are proposing um, an analytic, analy analytical form for this uh, for this uh, result, and actually, um, you can somewhat guess. I mean, if you're familiar with with all these approaches in standard, so you see that standard PT is failing to reproduce things close here, and this is due to that. Whereas reg PT, which is also two-loop calculation, but which contains partly this kind of resummation in it, built in, uh, it, it works well. Although it doesn't work well here, so we have to fix things. What we couldn't fix from a perturbation theory approach is the large Q behavior. So large Q behavior corresponds to the way UV modes are coupled to, to the mode you are interested in. So our, our uh, changing in the, in the UV um, affects back uh, the mode you are interested in. It's, it's obviously a, a key issue in, in, perturbation, in, in large scale structure growth because you don't want what you, what you have what you measure, what you want to measure, like say modes at k equal 0.2, to be too much depend, uh, dependent on the physics uh, in, at very small scales. You don't want that to, to, to go to affect back your system because that means that you cannot use this information for testing your models of gravity. Uh, it will be a failure in terms of the program I was mentioning in the very beginning that is using large scale structure as a, as a laboratory for, for modified, uh, for testing uh, gravities. So that, and surprisingly, uh, actually the, the dependence that I'm evoking here, that is uh, the, Q, the, the way this response function is behaving for large Q, uh, so it's much smaller, so the, the, the response function is much smaller than what we what you can expect from perturbation theory. And we have no real, ex no real explanation for that, except that so somehow uh, the physics is such that the, the, the UV part is screened away from, from the scale you are interested in. So it's good news in this sense. The initial uh, title of a paper, I think, was like uh, anomalies in this, res in this response function because we saw that as kind of anomaly in, in, in our system. So how much of that is, is um, screened away? Actually, it's, a, it's not an exponential cutoff, it's a Lorentzian damping. So this is basically what you need to, um, how you need to change your response function in this large Q regime uh, to go from the, this uh, two-loop two -loop results, uh, so this points to this red uh, line. It's a, okay. Um, so this is basically something we, we, saw, bef we saw before. And as, as I said, it's a good news because it makes uh, the dependence on, on the small scale physics weak. It also makes the dependence of 
what I'm going to do now that is to predict power spectra for different models uh, also weak on the precise uh, the precise way you actually uh, describe this, res this, this response function it's going down so the way it is going down it, it, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't count uh, it doesn't play any role in, in the final results <coughs> so this is the last step the last step is to use this uh, response functions so the way I was describing them and move from one model to another and this is the exercise we've, we've done here so you go from the from the blue I don't remember which one is where well. yeah, the blue to, to the red so the blue is is the, the, the model we start with the M1 model here and out of uh, simulations that has been done for the for the blue model, for this M1 model, you want to predict uh, the red. So here you have also a simulation for the red, right? And but but it's kind of blind test if you want. Uh, so you you start with that which is measured, that which is uh, uh, which is described uh, with this semi-analytical model, and you you predict this, right? Uh, knowing the difference in the linear in the linear regime, so the dif the linear part the dif uh, are this uh, dotted and dashed line, the linear power spectra, and this is how good you can be at different redshift one and 0.5. Uh, so so the, the black line here is a predict the prediction of this approach of this response approach. So you are able to move from here to there. So basically, we produce going on top of this uh, red. Uh, circles here uh, to a scale which is much larger than what a direct perturbation theory calculation would give you because you are taking advantage of your pre-knowledge right? there's no of course uh, and, and so this is, this is how we, we, we think of it right? and, and also for this uh, smaller redshift so you have it, it extends somehow the, the validity range of this perturbation theory. The price you pay is that you take advantage of a simulation to start with. So it's not first principle predictions. So you have basically uh, abandoned that. But on the other hand, you can extend your, your validity range. So I think I'm going to conclude. Um, to say that response function is kind of generic thing, right? It can be encountered in many uh, fields of physics. And here we try to, to implement that in the context of loss scale structures. So there are actually in the literature different flavors of the response function because you can derive with, with different things in terms of, of initial parameters. So this is the one we call response function here is, is with respect to the initial power spectrum. Uh, and and I'm, I'm stressing the fact that it could be a, a, one of the most effective way to actually analyze the data because you can really move around in parameter space well, you have to well define you have to, re to, to define this parameter space well enough but you can move around and in a way which uh, in which you can uh, you don't have to have necessarily a whole bunch of numerical simulations so it's actually uh, um, uh, available in, uh, as, a, as a public code which is called Respresso I don't remember what it stands for actually, Respresso. Response function for power spectra, something like that. It's written? Uh, okay, good. So if you go to this home page, this is what, what, it, uh, what it says. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it tells you how you can make a, a good coffee. Thank you. <laughs>